I want to say a few words about my life in this broadcast because I'm an old man who has endured alive after eight strokes and numerous temporary ischemic attacks, TIAs as they're known, where strokes were reversed by great medical care at great universities in the Los Angeles area. But eight strokes constitute a harbinger of death. And I may not get another opportunity to be able to speak to the people of this planet. For my work in cosmology, in electrical engineering, in atomic physics, will last as long as humans still inhabit the earth. And I want them to have some true facts about who I am. I was born in Opportunity, Washington on January 31, 1943. When and I was three years old, the family moved to approximately 122 acre farm 10 miles up the Green River from Auburn, Washington, about 25 miles from the Mount, Mount Rainier, about 35 miles from Seattle, and 10 miles from Auburn, Washington, a small town. I grew up on this farm from the age of three until 18, and we had approximately one half mile of the Green River running along one edge of our farm the eastern edge. And so I had an idyllic place to grow up and I know in the course of nature and politics that place where I grew up now a county park King County Washington will become a national monument. And I don't say that with any pride I say it with a knowledge of how things work. Today, I might be the village idiot. I might be stark raving mad. I leave that for the viewers and history to judge. History won't judge me unless I'm <clears throat> telling the truth about my work. I know that for sure. But in 1950, I was tested for reading comprehension level and I tested as having a college graduate's reading comprehension level. And in 1951, when I was in the second grade at Auburn's George Washington Elementary School, I saw a film over a period of many, many days. There was it was shown for about 15 minutes a day at lunchtime. And it was the day the earth stood still. That film, that viewing, is what started me on my quest to create spaceships by creating a method of powering spaceships when I was seven years old actually eight years old, I believe, because it was 1951 that film came out. In 1961, I graduated from Auburn High School and went to the University of Washington in Seattle. And I was enrolled there for three years. In 1964, I left there just bored out of my mind at the speed of classes. I am at heart and I always have been an autodidact. I suffer classes badly. 
by the time that I was done with the first class on the first day, I had already read all of the course materials and I used to have a photographic memory. The third stroke, which occurred about August 9th, 1996, took away my photographic memory and left me struggling to develop a merely photogenic memory. But that's life. And I've gotten part of my photographic memory back by a lot of hard work and a great deal of luck. And so I can sit here today and speak with a relative command of the English language. I totally lost my ability to read English on August 12, 1996 with that stroke at the Bad Samaritan Hospital in Los Angeles about half an hour after I'd been admitted. I had first gone there by cab at the direction of an eye doctor who knew that I'd had a stroke and he wanted me not to drive but he wanted me to catch a cab and go to the nearest general hospital be examined in the emergency room and have them call him. I did that as directed but of course I went to the Good Samaritan Hospital and I was at the triage point when the people decided that I was a drunk, I was high out of my mind, and so they had a policeman escort me outside the hospital and lock the door behind me. I was blind, but I felt my way around the building to the front again, got in to the building's front, to the triage area, and explained to them that I didn't know what was wrong with me, but I knew something was very wrong. That I was blind and something had happened to me, but I didn't know what. It turned out there was a woman doctor who was entering for her shift at that moment, saw me, and told me to come in, put me in a bed, in the emergency room, hooked me up to all the equipment, and about 20 minutes later, I had my fourth stroke. Uh, but I've obviously lived. I have no complaints about it. But after eight strokes now, several TIAs, I need to make some kind of recording to tell something about me that's from me and it gives more than photographs and a couple of minor recordings that Albert Einstein was able to leave upon his death in 1955. And I only bring him up because my work has modified some of the work of an old English scholar who everyone's heard of, who came up with the law of gravity and many other brilliant scientific works. Sir Isaac Newton. But in 1904, on November 26, by publication of a private letter to a colleague and former mentor in Germany, Albert Einstein refuted Newton's law of gravity with this theory of special relativity. He also produced three other hammer blows against existing science. My published works now and my practical scientific experiments in dark energy powered motors, generators, has now definitively changed the work and debunked partially the work of not only Newton, but of Albert Einstein, the greatest scholar that ever lived. I've simply tweaked the work of Einstein, who radically changed the work and added to the work 
of Sir Isaac Newton. But I have no apologies for being able to proclaim this is facts. I worked very, very hard, but I didn't create the fact that I had a 200 IQ as measured by my original test of IQ in a 10th grade <coughs> by taking the Stan excuse me, by taking the Princeton Standard Test. I got every question right. I was proctor tested by a representative of the company running the testing and utilization of the Princeton Standard IQ test, and I didn't miss a question in the proctored test. One of their people in the room watching me throughout my test in the second case. I also got in the Iowa Standard test in the third grade a perfect score. I didn't miss a question. Stanford Binet test in the seventh grade, I did badly. I understand from memory that I only had 176. I took the ABC standard test of the United States Army. In, I scored a perfect test on that, 200 IQ. So what I own use, I had talent when I was reading the newspapers, the Seattle Post Intelligencer and the Seattle Times, when I was three years old in the farm, 10 miles up the river from Auburn, Washington. I knew when I was seven years old and was tested for reading comprehension level as a college graduate that I was a genius. I was checking books out of the Auburn Public Library from the age of four. And I worked very, very hard educating myself because I knew I had a responsibility to the world by the time I was seven years old. And I knew what I wanted to do after watching The Day the Earth Stood Still. I wanted to work to bring peace to the earth. I wanted to be able to develop a rocket engine that could travel enormous, unimaginable distances across space, even light years across space. And I know that I have done the scientific work to accomplish those things. But between the scientific work and the acceptance of the science, which defies both Newton, Einstein, defies the laws of, of Michael Faraday, of Lentz, of too many others to quickly name, except for my own amusement. And I'm not that amused to do that today, but I've written them all out. They're in my writings on the internet. In many places you can find my writings on the internet and my videos talking about my work on the internet. But those are my goals at seven and in these last days they are still my goals. I've done the scientific work to develop the machine. I've done the scientific work to develop the theory of everything that corrects Albert Einstein's work and that of all of his successors up to this point and his predecessors. It's not something that makes me special, it's just a very unusual gift that I have worked very assiduously all my life to better and better and better. And today I have done that amazing thing. I started out after the second grade to work in science in more profound ways. But I actually had my first line scientific laboratory at four years of age. My own microscope, my own textbooks, etc. My own various things to teach me about science 
from a Chicago mail order source for high schools and college experiments in various sciences. And I don't know very much. It's impossible to. But I have some amazing skills and I've accomplished now amazing work. The problem is you can't just explain to the government that you've defied the work of Newton, Einstein, Lentz, Faraday, etc., 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 and have them believe you. I've tried to explain my work to DARPA, the research agency within the Department of Defense of the United States. They were not interested. When the United States was not interested, I tried at the, in 1900 and, and uh, 82, in the fall of that year, I tried to give that information to the Israeli embassy on Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. They had a man talk to me for a couple of hours. He was only interested in use of this type of motor for tanks. Nothing happened because wiser people and this tank commander turned diplomat knew that you can't be defying the laws of Newton and Einstein. You can't violate the laws of, you know, of, of conservation of energy. You just can't do that. You can't divide, you can't defy Newton's first three laws, that of motion, just can't do that. No, no more discussion needed, case closed. Well, I knew better. I knew that as Einstein knew, Newton was not the end. And I also knew that Einstein was not the end. I didn't think I was smarter than Einstein. I'm just building on the shoulders of the greatest scientist that ever lived. It's as simple as that. And I'm doing that because I can, because I've worked incredibly hard to develop the knowledge to do it. And I have the genius and imagination to have done it. In, in Dublin, Ireland, they have working devices of rotary type that demonstrate the truth of my work. They're now building piston. I have worked with them to actually change uh, their drawings now to, to piston type of dark matter driven engine. And I believe that they're now building prototype for that in Dublin, Ireland. But are they instantly believed by the world? Of course not. Those people are too clever. Once they find out that you violated the conservation of energy and matter, once you've defied the laws given to us by Albert Einstein and before him, Newton, Faraday, etc., 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 you can't possibly be taken seriously. But I will be. And I only hope that I will be taken seriously while I'm still alive because I have done an immense amount of work to provide working drawings, which I call design concept drawings, for dark matter energy powered motors that will be able to turn salt water into fresh water and can be used for pumping stations and pipelines to irrigate the three and a half million square miles, for example, of the entire Sahara Desert, the Gobi Desert, the Kalahari Desert, our eastern, eastern, uh, eastern, uh, the East's deserts, from from Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Kuwait, Yemen, etc., etc., etc all of the deserts of the world. I should note at this point that at the age of 12 I was able to watch our nearest neighbor Tom Spate who ran then the largest caterpillar made which was a D6 in his work as of a man who cleared forest 
for heavy equipment to bring out logs and take them to sawmills in the Auburn Enumclaw area. As we were living in the foothills of the Cascade Range and as I said not that many miles less than an hour's drive to Mount Rainier which goes over 14,000 feet into the air. I believe 14,410 it's usually rated at. But by watching Tom Spate do work which, which included the removal of old growth stumps in building roads into areas to log, I got to watch him make dynamite bombs. And I memorized how to make dynamite bombs. And I was able to be given dynamite to him when I was a little older. And I made dynamite bombs myself. By the time that I was in the 10th grade at Auburn High School, I was a specialized expert in making all kinds of bombs far beyond the reach of the mind of Tom Spate, our nearest neighbor. I made, in the 10th grade, in Mr. Cole's physics class, a nitrotriodide bomb a very small one in a vial and instantly upon having mixed it I emptied the vial in the long runway area between his blackboard and his in his tables that he did chemical experiments on in both chemistry and physics and it takes at room temperature of 70 degrees about 20 minutes for freshly stirred nitrotriodide to change into a high explosive that will go off with a feather touching it. And about 20 minutes into the lecture that day, he stepped on a tiny nitrotriodide bomb droplet, size of water drops. And it blew up under his foot and caused a small firecracker explosion. He immediately jumped and caused a whole series of more nitrotriodide tiny bomb explosions. He ran down the length of his area behind his workstation screaming fuck, which was a marvelous thing for, for us students who didn't get to hear that from teachers normally. And, and he was shocked beyond words until he the explosions all ended as all of them got, went off from his running around. And when he steadied himself, he had one word. Sanus? Yes, Mr. Coles. What did you do? Nothing, Mr. Coles. Well, he couldn't prove that I had made tiny bombs. He had no idea how to make tiny bombs out of trying to try it out. I was a specialist in making bombs of all kinds. I made, of course, nitroglycerin in small vials just to amuse myself and to learn, educate myself how to do it. I made all kinds of bombs. High explosive, low explosive, and incendiary bombs. I used the incendiary bombs to help Tom Spate on odd occasions to make roads for logging companies to blow up stumps. The way you do it, you drill a stump root system and you plant dynamite bombs using what is called, called a blasting powder has a name. It's a 60% nitroglycerin. It's, it's stumping powder, excuse me, stumping powder. 60% nitroglycerin and the rest diatomaceous earth and a black beauty number four, number five fuse, etc. and blasting cap and so forth, the whole thing. And I won't go into exactly how to do it. But, but uh, you then, with that blast, loosen the trees 
attachment to the soil around it and make it possible for a DC-6, the cat, caterpillar number six, with a chain and, and hook to shake it out of the ground. It loosens, loosen the soil's grip on it. You pull it out, drag it to an area, and then set fire to it with napalm, which he taught me how to make with simple gasoline and detergent, which I won't go into, but detergent mixed together and I learned how from him to make napalm. Well, that gave me an interest in an area of physics. And I studied the sun, of course, which until Einstein was thought by scientists to be made out of coal or some other fuel. Well, that of course turned out not to be true. Um, and but that was Einstein. But I wanted to know from these explosions all about atomic explosions. And at the age of 20, for example, I actually was able to talk to one of the world's greatest chemists, a man who held two Nobel Prizes, one for peace, and one for his development of vaccine to stop polio, Dr. Linus Pauling, when he lectured at the University of Washington, he permitted me to talk with him for about six hours after he spoke. And he bought me dinner because he was dumb enough to think that I was quite bright. And I laid out my exact way that on crude drawings on napkins at the hub which is, a, which is a, basically a dining and entertainment facility at the University of Washington for students and faculty I laid out how to build an atomic bomb at the age of 20 and he agreed that I had it right he was at least one person who was impressed by my cleverness but it wasn't until my experiments with magnets, just plain permanent magnets, bought in regular stores, that I knew as a child that something was wrong with our knowledge and our appreciation of permanent magnetism. In a textbook that I have in my home that was jointly written, it was a college textbook in physics, jointly written by a Nobel Prize winner in physics, it says this about magnetic energy. It says, magnetism, and I quote, quote, magnetism is an energy of a unique kind, close quote. Nothing more, no other elaboration. The Nobel Prize winning author had no clue. I wanted to know everything about magnetism that was permanent. A man named Werner Heisenberg, who ended his active career in physics, developing an atomic bomb weapon for Germany, and was at the end of the war captured and, and questioned by, by American forces and British forces. He had studied magnetism, and he had written on it, but he didn't understand magnetism, and I knew that from his writings. So I wanted to find out about it. In 1975, because of our first entry of significant numbers of military units into the Republic of South Vietnam, I went from being an ardent anti-war activist and demonstrator in Seattle to being a volunteer 
and I volunteered for the United States Army even though I had been a very very ardent anti-war advocate but I knew that if my country went to war it was my job to go to war simply because I knew I was a genius I knew I had amazing skills with weapons and I had studied an amazing amount of military history from the great battles of all over the world from earliest historical sources to the present. I knew that I could save American lives. If I were in a position of command in a war and so I volunteered for the draft in 1975 and they swore me in in Seattle and I took an oath to protect serve etc the Constitution of the United States and unlike many of the poseurs who pretend to believe in the Constitution but pretend for cash on radio and television programs pretend to be protected to the Constitution I took that oath seriously then and I do to this very moment and so when I volunteered for the United States Army, they accepted. I was sworn in in Seattle, and I flew to Fort Ord in Northern California for basic training. And there, in basic training in, in Fort Ord, I became an American soldier. And at the end of my training, in basic training at Fort Ord, Unlike all of the others in my training company, I was given no advanced training. I was given an assignment to report after taking a vacation at home. I was to fly from Seattle to Fort Richardson in Anchorage, Alaska, with no assignment except for overseas transportation and that was it and I thought that that as an incredibly bright person they should train me for war and there I was checking in at Fort Richardson and when I did check in I noticed that the person who was checking me in went to another person and a phone call was made and there was an army captain on the phone at my end at Fort Richardson who was talking to someone elsewhere and constantly saying sir yes sir yes sir etc sir and I knew from the protocol that I observed in basic training that that meant there was somebody at least a couple of grades higher than that captain so I thought, well, maybe I'm going to work for a very senior officer here because they figured out how clever I am. So I said, okay. And what happened was I was given another airline ticket to go to Fairbanks, Alaska. And I reported in to headquarters, headquarters company in Fairbanks, Alaska in the latter part of 1965 and there was no assignment I was just assigned to this to headquarters in the transient bay and I waited there for 14 days doing nothing and then a man came in the door of the transient bay and he looked at my disheveled state and said are you David Sanis 
And I said, yes, sir, immediately. Even though he was just simply dressed in exterior Parker clothes, in moon boots, in, in I just said, yes, sir. And he said, come with me. I was then taken to a place where I was confronted with a lone building, one story, with no windows, and one door in the middle of nowhere in the snow. Surrounded by a fence, it said, and I recall that fence very early, 1947 Walter S. McCarran Act. No admittance, use of deadly force authorized. No admittance, no trespassing, etc. Again and again, repeated around the perimeter of this fence, which is around a lone building without windows, but in one door. And this man, Sergeant Ware, Army Sergeant that he was, led me near to the only door, told me to stand back, and he then dialed his way into the building through this huge steel bank vault door. And I went in, we went into a hallway, there were two more doors, both bank vault doors. The second one, he told me to stand back, dialed his way into the second bank vault door, into an ante room that had a, had a low privacy screen. If you're sitting at a table there, or sitting at a desk there, but over it, you could see another bank vault door, and he told me to wait in there, not move, as he went through this folding gate and opened a third bank vault door. And a man came back with him through that door seconds later. His name was Mr. Norris, Chief Warrant Officer for Norris, Army. He came back and said, Sergeant Ware, take that man back to the barracks and get him into proper uniform. Get him shaved and get him a haircut and bring him back. And I went from thinking that I was being called in for questioning because it, as a student at the University of Washington, I'd gone to every kind of bizarre meeting you could. I'd been to anti-vivisectionist league meetings. I'd become a member of the International Flat Earth Research Society out of Dover, England. I had taken courses in, in, in uh, to become a miracle working minister from A. a. Allen's Miracle Valley Bible Institute in Miracle Valley, Arizona, and had graduated in health, healing, and holiness as an ordained Pentecostal minister, empowered in the words of Matthew chapter 10, verse 8 to heal the sick, to cleanse the leper, to raise the dead, and to cast out demons. Freely receive, freely give. And I had gone to every kind of political meeting from the American Communist Party to, to various socialist meetings, to various evangelical insane meetings of the radical right, and had publicly uh, discomfited some of the great preachers from the John Birch Society, for example, and in the, the, the great right-wing organizations then thriving in the United States, just as we were getting into problems in Southeast Asia again. And those were the Christian Crusade, the Christian Anti-Communist Crusade, and there I was challenged at a Christian Crusade meeting. And, and uh, for example, by the founder of that group, in a crowd of about 1,500 people, at the Eagles Auditorium in Seattle, and, and uh, <clears throat> was asked if I wanted to contribute in a mocking way since I had 
mockingly interrupted the founder of the organization. And I answered that that uh, I wanted them to contribute money to another cause that was not to their liking. And I had many hundreds of people start en masse toward me to do me serious or deadly bodily harm. I was a troublemaker, what can I say? I had to pull a practice grenade, army issue, but a dummy grenade. I had to pull the pin, throw it down, scream, die, motherfuckers, and as the crowd all fled, not so intent upon doing me bodily harm anymore, as fleeing for their very lives, I was able to walk out of the Eagles Auditorium and run down towards a huge hole that was for excavation for the I-5 freeway. I had similar incidents. I didn't have a sniper take a shot at me until I was in the third year at the University of Washington and I happened to glance out my dormitory window on the third floor of Terry Hall just as a car on Campus Parkway slowed to a stop I saw movement in the back seat dropped to the floor just ahead of a bullet that pierced my window. And I've just been a troublemaker. That's what, all I can tell you. I've had a lot of fun. I've had a wonderfully fun life, studying enormously subjects that I thought would be useful to the Earth's inhabitants, and having a lot of fun as a rabble-rouser troublemaker. Just another troublemaker, is all I can say. I want to live long enough to be able to bring this into fruition, and then I can die. I'll be happy with that. I'll be happy if I die today. But I want to get out at least some information about who I really am, because <laughs> people would rather believe insanities peddled by people without knowledge of things without parallel and believe that than they would facts from a man sitting here in the Griffith Park below my favorite place Griffith Observatory. If I could walk better I'd be there tomorrow. But I'm here today because I have limited mobility. Now why do I have limited mobility? That's the third area I want to talk about. When I was drafted into the United States Army as a volunteer, and I was a person who was happy to go to Fort Ord to basic training. I was a volunteer for a two-year term. I volunteered for the draft in 1965. And at the end of that time, as I said, I had no orders, but I eventually ended up. And the reason there were no orders is because I was being investigated so that they could or not give me a security clearance for cryptographic materials. Because they had already planned that if I passed the security examination, I would become a member of the National Security Agency, who would be a counterintelligence agent, one whose job was to protect cryptographic equipment, cryptographic codes, and the loyalty of the men operating our codes and the code machines. And that worked out. At Fort Wainwright, I was drafted into the, when I came back in proper uniform and shaven and cleaned up with a haircut, 
I came back and to Mr. Norris, inside the vault, inside a vault, inside a vault, and found I'd been drafted into the National Security Agency. And I was there for counterintelligence and protection of codes, code equipment, and the loyalty of the men that operated that equipment and their safety. So I began training there, and I already had an extraordinary background in such techniques, of course, from the age of 12. I'd been a hunter, a fisherman. And before that, I'd been a counterintelligence agent since I was four years old. What I did as a counterintelligence agent at the age of four was dress in rags with my father's rubber barn boots, shodding my feet. And then I would walk along the Green River Bank about half a mile that we had along our property. We had an area where fishermen would come along this. And we also had an area where we sold fruit and, veg and vegetables. A stand by the by Green River Valley Road. And I would take over for my older brothers and sisters as the salesman for fruits and vegetables, which would work only on weekends because we were within half a mile of the Flaming Geyser Park. That park is joined with the farm property that I grew up on and is a county park of King County in Washington State. And as I said, in a matter of years, will become a national monument for me. I'll be dead. I won't care. I don't care today. But it will happen in the course of history. That's what happens. And I would sell fruit and vegetables in my undercover role as a crippled, speech defective, very mentally challenged child. And I would have one good leg and one good arm. And I would walk back and forth in front of our vegetable and fruit stand as people were headed on weekends and holidays to the Flaming Geyser Park to picnic and fish and recreate. And they would see me though. It would form something in their head as they went by. And we had a lot of people that would stop on the way back. Having thought about it, felt guilty that they didn't care about humanity, and by God, coming back to wherever they were going home to would stop. And find out that not only was I crippled, but I was deaf, and I was very intellectually defective. Even more than a day. And I could sell flats of vegetables and fruit at tremendously inflated prices from what my other brothers and sisters could sell them for. Because I was very intellectually retarded, very crippled, and deaf. And all I'd had as an act was this terrible limp that they saw on their way to the park. But I learned by the age of four that admissions against interest are almost universally accepted by people. They believe admissions against interest almost all the time. And if someone is acting very intellectually challenged, deaf, crippled, dressed in rags, they believe all of it and more. So I was very successful at that. At the age of four, I started conning fishermen out of steelhead and rainbow trout during different seasons of the year. There was the first time that I recall consciously getting someone's steelhead. It was Judge Long, who was a Superior Court judge in King County. And that was in 1947 in the winter. He had a very nice steelhead laying on the bank. He and his son were fishing. They were out in the shallow water. And I came along crippled, 
speech defective, deaf, mentally challenged to an extraordinary degree. And I petted the dead fish, this great steelhead, about a 12 pounder. And I yelled out to Judge Long and his son, Alva Long, Fifty thick, fifty thick, fifty thick. I can't call mommy C6. And I'm cleaning up my accent a little bit so it's easier to understand, the listener. They were so taken by the presence of this crippled child trying to help the fish by taking home to the mother to fix that they let me have it and I did take it home to my mother to fix and a lot of starts and stops dragging this fish as I got to our farmhouse and she fixed it by baking it and did a good job fixing that fish and from then on until I was about 14 they used to regularly let me have their steelhead trout in the spring and summer and their steelhead in the fall fishing season. And I would bring them home to mother to fix. Until one day my younger sister and I were performing our professional wrestling acts, tributes to the professional wrestling channel that was on, one of the three channels that we had on our television. And they saw me at 14, not totally crippled, not speech defective, not deaf, not mentally challenged enormously, but saw me as I was and burst into laughter and loved it. And I was a friend of, of the son even to near the point of his death. He turned out to be an absolutely brilliant attorney. And this man and his son were influences on me in my life. I thought it would be a great idea to study law, to learn about the law. And I also thought about using the law to help the Muckleshoot Indian tribe. The Muckleshoot Indian Reservation was about 12 miles from our farm by road. Fewer miles across the woods. And I saw how terribly they were treated by regular whites. Both farmers and the townspeople in the Auburn, Washington. And it got me angry. By the time I was tough enough in the third grade, I stopped harassment against Muckleshoot Indian children by catching people from behind in the school grounds and knocking them out from behind. I've never fought fair in my life. I don't believe in it. I have always fought as a hunter, as a trapper. Never fair. And unfortunately, that molded me. So it was both good and bad. I developed a very poignant appreciation of the despicable nature of white supremacy, of white ability to believe themselves superior to people of other colors and to act on that. And it's given me a huge part of my personality in my life. Uh, in Vietnam, 
I saw black soldiers racially discrim discriminate against Vietnamese citizens. And I certainly got lessons in the universality of prejudice racially. And I also saw at the University of Washington in 1961 in the fall when I first went there the tremendous prejudice against people of lesser talents intellectually and of people who didn't have the wherewithal to attend the University of Washington and weren't becoming sophisticated scholars or what passed for the same. And I didn't like it. And I also saw how students, faculty, the whole University of Washington community could manage to ignore people in trouble, physically, emotionally, racially, in terms of gender, etc. And I didn't like it. And that has been the bane of my life. It started out within two or three days of my coming to the University of Washington in August of 1961. I saw a woman in trouble. I could tell she was in trouble. She was standing near a bridge on Interstate Highway 5 near the dormitory Terry and Lander Halls, that I, in which I lived in Terry Hall. And it struck me she was standing by the rail too long. So I got my shoes on, my tennis shoes, and I ran to the bridge and talked to her. And she was extremely depressed. And so I brought her back to the dormitory and went upstairs, gathered all my change in a bag, and I took her downtown by bus number seven to a very elegant restaurant on the waterfront next to the ferry terminal. And it was a Tahitian style restaurant on a pier. And I took her there, bought her a great steak dinner, and I had water. They didn't have money for both of us. And using all of my change, just about, for the dinner and the rest for a tip, at this place it was called the Polynesian. And in talking to her on the way back to the campus area and by continuing contact with her, I was able to help her change her life. And as I said, that's been the bane of my existence. Since August 61 to date, I have spent over nine million dollars that I have earned in my careers on helping people with problems with alcohol, addictive drugs, and or mental impairment and or personality problems. For example, for 12 years between 1970 and 1982, I visited the state of Calif state of Washington's only prison for women. It is at Purdy, P U R D Y Washington, and I was there every weekend for the full day, either a Saturday or Sunday or holiday day. And I counseled women in the only penitentiary for women at that time in the state of Washington. I counseled the ones 
who were there, and they were basically all in there for some kind of murder or lesser homicide charge and or for major drug running deals where they were acting as mules and had been caught. And I was able to help a lot of people. I also worked from 1970 to 86 helping people who were intellectually challenged on a regular basis, on a daily basis. And that cost a lot of money, although less than the prisoners. But the biggest cause that I've had is trying to help alcoholics and addicts. I've spent, as I said, a fortune together with all these works. It's been a, been a part of my day every day, virtually, since August 1996. Excuse me, since August 1961. As I said, I have anomalies in my memory because of a hit on my hippocampus, which happened on August 12, 1996, from a stroke that affected my hippocampus and created a little electrical storm there, and I lost my photographic memory. And I'm struggling to regain at least a photogenic memory with some photographic memory I now have restored. But I have worked with alcoholics, addicts, and all these people. Partially just because I saw it was there in August of 1961 when I came to the University of Washington within two days of being there. And then That leads into the other part that I want to discuss, and that is that in Vietnam, as an agent of the National Security Agency, within a few days of arrival, I met a man named Mr. Antuna, who was drafted the first days of World War II to become a Navajo Indian code talker from his reservation home in Arizona. And Mr. Antuna was an extraordinary man. He was the chief of station of the National Security Agency for the Central Third of Vietnam. And when we met me being a few days into Vietnam service, it was his first day. He landed in Saigon, taking a plane to Quinh Quin Yan in the middle of the country where I was. And he immediately found out my location, commandeered a jeep, and came to talk with me. And he told me that I was going to be the National Security Agency's second in command there in the central third of Vietnam and we would be responsible for the Army's communications in that central third of Vietnam. And as Deputy Chief of Station for the National Security Agency agent, I was also an Army employee and I got my pay and allowances and my grade were nominally that of an army person, but my work was NSA. And that was absolutely top secret knowledge available only to those people who were also NSA agents. Other than that, I could not tell them who I was. I simply had to, by force of personality, convince them to obey me. The only thing I could say is that they did not have a need to know and they did not have clearance to know who I was. But if they failed to follow my orders, they would find out that there would be severe consequences for their future in the military. Effective 
almost immediately. But certainly, within whatever time it took me to get them to superiors, who would get to the Department of Defense and who would, without telling them who I was, but tell them that I had authority, they could either follow it or be drummed out of the Army that day or whatever other units they were in, Air Force, Marine Corps, Navy. And that was fun authority for a kid who was basically a smart ass. It was great. And that job was wonderful. I was able to save a lot of American lives by my work as a counterintelligence agent in Vietnam. But unfortunately, with my photographic memory, I was called upon by the National Security Agency in my job to perform a task that is a task that has made me a monster. As part of protecting the approximately 47 communication centers that were active in the central third of South Vietnam during my three tours of combat duty in that country, I had to make certain that no one could successfully attack the communications facilities that we had. And the Strategic Air Command had a problem in that they could not return to station without releasing their bombs someplace. They could not land with their bombs. And as an expert on the communication centers, locations, coordinates, I gave coordinates on a regular basis to the Strategic Air Command for the purpose of their dropping bombs on these areas surrounding communication centers that we believed on a basis of information available to us harbored people who would attempt to attack these communication centers and to get away with our cryptographic equipment and or our codes. I gave the Strategic Air Command these coordinates on a regular basis in my three tours of combat duty in Vietnam. And they bombed the hell out of a lot of these places. To put some idea about it, the B-52 H bomber carried a payload of 120 500 pound bombs. That is a total of 60,000 pounds of high explosives. I traveled on a daily basis all over Central South Vietnam and I saw the effects of a lot of bombings that were done on coordinates that I'd given to the National Security Agency's people and to the Strategic Air Command people. And I'm responsible directly and became a mass murderer soon into my first tour of duty in South Vietnam. That changed me. Mainly my life has been devoted to helping children of addicts and alcoholics since I came back to Vietnam to somehow perform an impossible task of redeeming the lives of children who would otherwise have been put at risk by others than me at war. And that's what I've devoted myself to. Except for living with two wives 
since I came back from Vietnam in February 4th, 1968. Except for living with two wives, I have lived in extreme simplicity and poverty by my own desires and given away almost all of the money that I've made, literally. Total over nine million so far. But the good news is, is that it also made me study science again to try and fulfill my dream from the second grade of building amazing new sources of power and energy. Since our fossil fuels are running out, since other fuels are extraordinarily expensive to use on the scales that humans need fuel. I have now developed inexhaustible fuel that will last as long as our planet lasts, which should be several billion years, and as long as humans live on it. 